Good morning, Southwest. If you'd all like to stand with us, we will begin our worship. So oh. 
As we come to our time of communion this morning, uh, just a couple of things. If you haven't gotten uh, a communion cup, we have those on the side tables out in the floor. You need to grab one of those. And they are a little bit tricky. There's a membrane on top. You pull that first membrane up, and there's a wafer underneath there. And then when you pull the second membrane, and of course the juice is there. So if you haven't done that, please do that uh, uh, before we take communion here in just a bit. Also, we do practice open communion here at Southwest Christian Church. So if you're uh, a confessed believer in Jesus Christ, we ask you to be a part of that. In our daily Bible reading, we're going through the chronological reading of the Bible. And so we've been in the Old Testament for quite a while now, and still are. And I'm amazed, just absolutely amazed, at the miracles that God did for the Hebrew nation, the nation of Israel, as he brought them out of Egypt. And I'd like us to just take a little bit of a journey there and then jump to the New Testament this morning. Um, so God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt with so many miracles, with uh, the plagues of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, with water from a rock and manna and quail. And he just time and time and time again, he performed these miracles in front of them and for them. And one thing that I want to make th that you just remember today as we go through this is this phrase, obedience, then deliverance. Obedience, then deliverance. If you think about the nation of Israel and all those miracles that he performed as he brought them out, each time he was asking for their obedience, but they didn't obey him. In fact, when they sent the spies to the land of Canaan, uh, and they came back, only two, J Joshua and Caleb, said we can conquer them. The rest said we can't. Because of that, because of that disobedience, God had them wander in the desert for 40 years. Does anybody know how long it takes to walk from Egypt to the land of Canaan if they hadn't have done that? 11 days. 11 days, but they wandered for 40 years because God had to teach them over and over and over and over again obedience, then deliverance. He said, if you'll obey me, I'll deliver the enemies into your hands. I'll deliver you to a land of milk and honey. Now let's jump forward to the New Testament. Today's Palm Sunday. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem today, and people are laying down the palm branches and their cloaks and their robes, and they're singing hallelujah, and they're saying, Hosanna, son of David. And they thought he was coming as a conquering Messiah. They didn't understand he was coming as a servant savior. And some of those same people later in the week would be the ones that would yell for him to be crucified because they didn't understand that. So today he's coming into Jerusalem. Tonight he goes back to Bethany, which is two miles east of Jerusalem, and he stays in the house of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and that's the same Lazarus that he raised from the dead. Tomorrow morning he goes and he clears the temple of the dishonest money changers. He goes back to Bethany again. On Tuesday he comes back again, and he's tested by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin as they plot to get rid of him. That's the day that they met with Judas and set the plan in action to get rid of him. On Wednesday, there's no record in the Bible what Jesus was doing this week. Most Bible scholars believe he was back at Bethany again at the house of Lazarus, and they were resting as they prepared for the Passover. Thursday, he left Bethany for the very last time, and he went to the upper room to have the Passover meal with the disciples. He washed their feet. He showed them that he was a servant savior. And he gave us the obedience of taking communion. As he asked us to do this, as many times as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Thursday evening, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying fervently. And he said, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup, may this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours. In all those events, think of that statement. He who knew no sin was going to become sin. He knew that. 
yet he was obedient. Many people say, well, what did he mean when he said, if this cup could pass from me? Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew exactly why he was here and what his mission was and what God's perfect plan was. But he knew that as he became sin, my sin and your sin and the sins of the world, that he would be apart from the Father for that period of time. So as we look at the Old Testament and we think about obedience, then deliverance, we see the same thing with Jesus as he prayed that prayer. And then he gave us the example of obedience. Then a week from today, as he's resurrected, we have the deliverance. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Have you ever been in a situation where the crisis, there is just a crisis in your life? And you pray to God saying, God, if you will do this, I'll do that. I prayed that prayer. And I know many of you probably have too. But that's actually the wrong way to pray. That's asking for deliverance, then obedience. And it doesn't work that way with God. It's obedience, then deliverance. I want you to pray with me. Jesus, as we come to this time communion we remember what you did for us the blood you shed the body you gave up Lord we're humbled by what you did for us to take on our sin debt and we rejoice in knowing that if we're obedient if we're obedient to you and we walk a path that is pleasing to you then there is deliverance we remember all that you have done all that you are doing and all that you will do in your name we pray Amen. As we sing this next song, if you just meditate on that, on those words and what Jesus has done for you in remembrance of him, and then when you feel like it, you take communion. You were the word at the beginning, one with God.
thank you for worshiping with us. Well, good morning, Southwest. It's an honor to be here on Palm Sunday. Um, it was an honor Randy asked me to fill in today, um, be praying for his family as, as which son is it again? I, I get the two confused. Aaron, okay, that Aaron's getting ready to be dedicated for the mission field, so be, be in prayer for that. It's an awesome blessing. Um, Many of you, if any of you know me, I love to watch sports, and of course my brother Ed would tell you I'm a diehard Cubs fan, and they're about the only team that I truly root for, but I'll watch about any sport, regardless of who's playing, especially this time of year, right, with the NCAA tournament, you see the extremes of the joy of victory and the agony of defeat. You see the excitement of the trophy being lifted up and the nets being cut down. You usually see another camera shot as well, though, right? You see the losing team, some in tears, some realizing that this is the end of their sport of choice in the, at this level. Some are probably thinking, what could we have done different? They take the loss in stride and they study tape for future reference. Or sadly, they get so caught up in what should have happened, they get extremely jealous of the success of the other team. Remember back in the early 90s? Remember Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan? That whole deal? You know, someone, someone gets paid to sabotage Nancy Kerrigan because she was stealing Tanya's thunder. Mike Tyson bites off the ear of Evander Holyfield in their second fight out of desperation and ends up losing his ability to fight for several years. So much of the reason we have a financial debt crisis in America is because of this. Students across the country racking up record student loan debt because they feel that if they go to the more expensive school, then they'll be noticed. Kids go off to college a lot of times with the motivation of needing to compete on the social status ladder. Today, as Dale just pointed out, is Palm Sunday, the start of Holy Week. We're going to break down John chapter 12 and see the different ways we should be living a life that brings honor to God and not one that lives in constant jealousy for what we do not have. We'll begin to prepare our hearts for the realization of what next week represents real triumph and real joy out of what originally appears tragic. In this lesson, we reflect on these familiar passages. I want us to see how honoring our king with everything we have is what brings us real satisfaction and contentment, not the material things of this life. Let's look at the first part of our text. John 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those, reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may be keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, 
but you do not always have me. Our first point today is that we see we can honor Jesus through generous giving. Honor Jesus through generous giving. Now, I'm not saying we should stop right now and take a second offering. But isn't it interesting that John points out here that how resources get used can reveal a person's heart and intentions? Look at the difference of perspective here. We see Martha serving Jesus, her brother Lazarus, who was just revived from death shortly before this, reclining with him. And we see Mary anointing the feet of Jesus with pure nard. I found on DrAxe.com that spikenard oil today is, co is a common oil used in aromatherapy and to help, it helps to treat insomnia and digestive problems. However, in Bible times, it was extremely hard to get and very costly. According to our text, it is pointed out that this one pound would have been 300 denarii, roughly a year's wage for an agricultural worker in Bible times. Judas, though technically correct, the money could have been given to the poor. He wasn't pure in his motives, as we know. We read in Matthew 26, 14 through 16, Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. According to a footnote in my study Bible on this text, the 30 pieces of silver was about four months of a laborer's yearly salary, which is less than half the cost of the nard spent to anoint Jesus by Mary. Randy and your leadership team here at Southwest are faithful leaders who care about exalting Jesus in the community. Part of that responsibility is to make financial decisions with what you give. When you look at passages like John 12 or the woman who gave two small coins in Mark 12:42, we see that our giving is a reflection of our heart. When you give money or other resources to the church, you're not just paying another bill. You're actually participating in the worship of our king. So honor God in being generous in your giving. Let's continue on in our text, verses 9 through 11. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Here we see our next point, that we are to honor God through our testimony, honoring God through our testimony. Now, unless you've lived in a cave for the last several years, we've entered into a season of time where everybody wants to cancel everything. Calls to defund the police, famous books being censored, to how the media has changed from telling you to what happened to being slanted either left or to the right. Our world is going in a way that causes me to long for heaven more and more. If anything good did come from social distancing for me, it was the realization that as a church, quite frankly, too many of us are complacent when it comes to sharing our testimony. When the shutdowns happened early last year, it forced me to find time to study deeper and develop new avenues of preaching. I utilized social media to share devotionals I wrote based on my master's thesis at Lincoln. I, I preached back in the fall at a church up in Kell a few times, in addition to what I do with our middle schoolers over at Central. One thing I've been doing more and more of is not just leaving that message there, but then I'll take that and share it with my coworkers and give it to them for encouragement. Here in our text, we see Lazarus being brought back to the center stage. He's been raised from the dead. Now, many of these people are curious about what Jesus will do next. But again, we see jealousy set in as the Pharisees plot to kill Lazarus. Now, what motivation is there in killing someone who Jesus has already raised one time? It's about silencing. 
It's about keeping miracles hidden because Jesus has taken away their influence on society. Thank God for people such as John the Baptist who had the right mindset when he stated that Jesus must increase and that he must decrease. We are to use our lives for not for self-promotion or competition with others, but for proclaiming the work of Jesus in our own lives. We must be bold in our faith and live as Paul stated in Colossians 3, verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It is our responsibility to tell the good news tactfully. It is our calling to minister, whether in our homes, on the job, on the ball field, to model a spirit of humility and kindness. It is about reflecting Christ in our everyday lives. Honor God with our testimony. Let's continue on, verses 12 through 19 of chapter 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done the sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Next, our next point here is that we honor God through humble praise. Honoring him through humble praise. Back in Leviticus 23, the Israelites were directed in the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. They were directed to take the branches of palm trees, celebrating in little booths for seven days as a reminder to the future generations of Israel that God delivered them out of the slavery of Egypt. It would become a symbol of national pride in Israel, a form of showing honor and respect to someone in authority. Now, even though the people in Jerusalem for the Passover were misdirected in a lot of Jesus' ultimate purpose, their showing honor to him was still humble and unselfish. They honored someone they saw or heard about deliver Lazarus from the dead and looked to him to bring ultimate freedom. Unfortunately, they, looked, they were looking for freedom from the Roman rule of the day, but they were still humbly worshiping. When riding on Patmos, John in his later life said in Revelation 7, 9 through 12, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation! belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and power and might be to God forever and ever. Amen. Just as Jesus was prophesied as the coming king and revealed to the world as a leader who sat humbly on a donkey colt to enter the city, it is spoken prophecy that waving palm branches even now is a symbol for our roles in the heavenly kingdom, one of humble worship and praise. Let's, we'll go on forward to verses 20 through 26. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Beth Bethsaida in Galilee, 
and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Here we see that we honor Jesus through sacrifice. Honor Jesus through sacrifice. Here we have Greek Gentiles who have left behind pagan religions to follow more closely to the Jewish law. And are, and are spiritually drawn to works of words of Jesus. The reason for Philip going to Andrew and the two of them going to Jesus was their request in his response to to his telling them earlier not to go to the Gentiles. But here, Jesus announces it's time for the expansion of his impact. Part of that expansion would be commissioned upon his death. Jesus uses a very familiar agricultural metaphor, the grain of wheat going into the ground and bringing new life. He says this after saying that his hour has come to be glorified. Now, the Greeks most likely have thought isn't that what you were already doing? Isn't that what you got when you rode the donkey into town? They didn't understand his glory would not be fully understood until he accomplishes his mission at Calvary. He also directs a personal application to the Greek-seeking Jews and that it is critical to be a servant. William MacDonald's Believer's Bible Commentary states on verse 26, Service now will receive God's approval in a coming day. Whatever one suffers of shame or reproach here will be small indeed compared to the glory of being publicly commended by God the Father in heaven. Let's look at verses 27 through 36 now. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it, it just thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has came for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of the world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Here we see our next point, and that is that we are to honor Jesus, allowing his spirit to flow through you. Honoring Jesus, allowing his spirit to flow through you. Notice how Jesus started this section. He admits he is troubled by the upcoming pain he will face. Fully God and fully man, why does he need to seek for the Father to glorify him? His purpose was for the crowds present to hear confirmation that he is who he says he is. When Moses approached the burning bush, God revealed himself to Moses. In like manner, Jesus uses yet another opportunity that reveals his light unto the world. 
Jesus reveals that he will be lifted up for telling his upcoming death on the cross. Donald Guthrie, in his commentary on John 12, had this to say regarding Jesus telling about his purpose in facing his hour. He said, For those who come to faith through the cross, judgment has already taken place at the cross through which they will gain deliverance. The double result is seen clearly in the driving out of the prince of the world and in the magnetic power of Jesus to draw himself. The instrument by which Satan designed to defeat Jesus became the means for the overthrow of his own power. This week I ask that we approach the cross with a fresh perspective. Yes, it represents the death of sin. Yes, it represents freedom for the sinner. But more importantly, it released power and the light to reign within our hearts and outpouring onto a world so desperately in need. When, what does Jesus tell the disciples and others when he gives the Great Commission? Acts 1.8. He tells them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. If you only focus on the cross and the empty tomb, you are missing the rest of the story. From the beginning when he created Adam and Eve, he intended humans to be involved as kingdom workers. Be the light, letting his spirit flow from you every single day. We, we move on to verses 37 through 43. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what we, what we heard, what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even on the authorities believed in him, but because of the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Here we see our next point, that we are to honor God's opinion rather than man's. Honor God's opinion rather than man's. From the time we are just children... We have been built with a desire to be loved and to, be, to build relationships with others around us. Many of us find like-minded activities to build camaraderie with other people. We even get together for Bible study to build up each other and to unite in spiritual training. Many times, though, what happens is we get so caught up in trying to improve our social standing around others, we neglect our relationship directly with the Father. The Moody Bible commentary states on the Isaiah prophecy quoted by John. Jesus had performed so many signs, but the majority did not find the miracles convincing. As a result, the people were not believing Jesus. John cited a well-known messianic passage about God's suffering servant as now fulfilled in Christ. The arm of the Lord is a figure of speech for God's power displayed in Jesus' miracles. The rhetorical questions of the Old Testament prophecy suggest that only a remnant in Israel would believe the message of the Messiah. You see, the Pharisees were so wrapped up in the influence of people under their authority, they didn't recognize the true affluence of Jesus and what his presence meant. I want to read that again. The Pharisees were so wrapped up in their own influence of people under their authority that they didn't recognize the true affluence of Jesus and what his presence meant. His reign as the one true king of kings was a threat to their power and caused them to further plot the death of Jesus. 
Likewise, we've gotten so wrapped up in being relevant that we restrict the freedom of the Holy Spirit to be revealed in our lives. Is our life about gaining power and prestige for ourselves or for allowing our Creator to perfect us as His vessel to do great works for Him? We must humble ourselves and seek out God's opinion of us. Let's finish out our text in John 12, verses 44 through 50. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees him who sent me, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who has sent me has himself given me a commandment. What to say and what to speak. And I know that this commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Finally, we see that we honor the word of God as it brings us life or death. Honoring the word of God as it brings us life or death. Newsflash, guys. All of us in here, barring the return of Jesus coming back to get us, our life here will come to an end with our death. As such, it's not just wise, but of critical importance to begin to think about what happens after we leave this earth. The past few weeks, my wife Jill and I started the process working with an attorney to, to develop our living trusts that would be used to direct how our estate is settled if we were to pass away. Many times people delay working on estate planning because they think, that's just morbid. But sad as it may be to think about, it's wise to leave a plan for someone to act on your behalf, to distribute what you have, ensure your children have an action plan in place so that although they may be grieving your untimely death, they have a safe place to allow a smooth transition into the next stage of their life. According to the website caring.com, the number of adults who have a will in 2021 has risen only slightly from 32.1% in 2020 to 32.9% today. That means two out of every three adults do not even have a plan after they die. That is not just sad, it's scary when you think what would, when you don't think what would happen next. The survey continued on that for the first time, people age 18 to 34 are more likely to have a will than those age 35 to 54. I'm not trying to scare anybody in here, yet I'm saying we need to wake up to the reality this isn't our home. We have a responsibility to live wisely. We have a duty to direct resources we leave behind. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Now, of course, what we leave behind is not limited to our material blessings. Psalm 78, verse 4 says, We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. Paul tells his protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If we sit under great teaching or as you study on your own, it's not just enough to keep it for yourself, but to share it doing the work of an evangelist. In this last section of John, we saw that 
Jesus is about salvation, but he cannot deny the truth of Scripture. Verse 47, let's look at it again. It said, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. When you assemble a will, a state trust, power of attorney, you are leaving written clear directions for a judge to enforce. You are leaving behind directives on how things are to go after you die. The words of the Bible are our living trust given to us. They are words of life. When we speak scripture, we are declaring truth. When we study scripture, we're inheriting the words of the Holy Spirit. When Moses passed away and Joshua took over the leadership of Israel, God gave Joshua this command in Joshua 1 verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Today, are there areas in your life where you're struggling to show honor? You failing, are you failing to put time in the Bible study on your own? Are you playing the comparison game constantly? Do you idolize people in your life or not even in your life? Do you limit your worship of God to these four walls or is God truly your Savior and King? Or do you just see him as a spiritual soda machine? As we close today, my prayer is that we would learn to honor Jesus that is due him. I ask for you to humbly accept him for what he accomplished, not just for salvation, but for what he is calling each and every one of us to do. I pray that we look at the words of scripture and meditate regularly. I ask that we all seek Jesus today in a fresh way. This Passion Week, I ask for you each to become honorable members of God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have created us for your glory, not our own. Help us to honor you as we leave this place today not just in not just in organized moments of worship but in our daily routine activities of work, school, home activities help us to reflect your true nature help us to to share our testimony with boldness so that others may see your light Help us to appreciate this Easter season with a fresh perspective, with new hope, with your calling. In Jesus' name, amen. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along, put me back together. Now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you.
fears and flaws, oh Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain, is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. Turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. You're the There's nothing better than Jesus. Nothing. As we come to prayer this morning and to our offering, let's keep in prayer for Mary Carol. She's going through a lot with her mother passing. Keep in prayer Ryan Maines. His surgery's coming up on August the 16th. Keep Sierra and Aaron in prayer. They're trying to figure out when and if they get to go to Africa. Keep our schools and our teachers they need us there really bad. Pray for protection and healing and wisdom, and pray for a revival. You said this morning in Sunday school that Jan said something. Revival starts at home, and it has to with our kids and our grandkids. So as we come to prayer and offering time, our offering uh, box is to my right if you want to give there. So let's bow and pray. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for this day. And there's nothing better than you. We just lift up your name. We lift up the ones here in prayer, dear Lord. We ask that you be with them, you touch them, and you, need, you know their needs, you know their hurts, you know their pains. Just be with them, be with us as a church. In your precious name I pray, amen. We get ready to do announcements this morning. Um, Ron, is there a video we're showing? Oh, okay. All right, uh, so our, for our announcements this week, first of all, I want to thank James for bringing us a message this morning. Thank you for that powerful message. We appreciate that very, very much, James. Also, I want to recognize Jeff Reed is here with us up here in the front row, um, just recently back from his last mission trip, so we appreciate him and all that he does, and if you want to get an update, I'm sure he'd be happy to give you an update on what's going on and what the needs still are uh, for his mission. Uh, there is no Wednesday uh, morning Bible study this week. Of course, Resurrection Sunday is next week. 
What a perfect time to invite somebody to church. I know we should always be doing that, but what a perfect time now to invite friends or family or somebody from work to church. Um, there is a sunrise service at Meadowbrook at 7 a.m. There is no breakfast this, uh, this time, but uh, at 7 a.m. at Meadowbrook on next Sunday. Uh, and then the next soup kitchen appears is, looks like, April 13th. Is there any other announcements that I've missed this morning? If not, I'll close in prayer. Jesus, we just thank you for this day, for the blessings of this week. And Jesus, we pray that the path we walk this week is just pleasing to you. Help us to grow in our relationship with you, to become stronger in the word and stronger in you, and help us to witness to others. Because we know, Jesus, that uh, the great commission is for us to go out and make disciples of all nations. So help us to be disciples for you this week. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. Give God your best and let him do the rest. I saw darkness run for cover.